for the good of land and people, keeping working lands in working hands. So that's, um, that's what I'm going to start with. Okay, uh, there's, there's actually three points that I want to cover today. One is I want to explore the question, um, is ranching and are ranchers a keystone species in a West that works? So, and I'll explain what a keystone species is in just a second. Uh, the second point is this rural-urban divide, this polarization we see in America. And interestingly, it sorts itself along rural and urban um, divisions. And can actually ranching contribute to this through food and open space? OK, so let's start off with the keystone species. Um, and a keystone species is a term we use in ecology. It's basically a species whose impact is, is way out of proportion to its numbers. And I think we all are pretty comfortable with the idea that there are not a lot of ranchers in the American West. We're talking, you know, 20, 30, 40,000. And that probably would depend on the size of the outfit. And so the question is, could ranchers, in a sense, be this ecological equivalent of a keystone species? And, um, and so their importance is disproportionate. And, and so um, are this modest number of ranchers actually having a profound impact on a West? And I'm going to look at the ecology, the economics, and the culture of this. So we'll look at the ecology first. Uh, I heard this actually from Bob Budd years ago. And um, the thing that we, we do need to appreciate in terms of domestic livestock is that grasses, forbs, and shrubs have co-evolved with grazing and browsing. And as Bob used to say, otherwise, why do they have so many thorns? And of course, that's a really obvious uh, way to make the point there. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the American Southwest, and everything uh, seems to have thorns down there, and there's darn little grass. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it shouldn't be a big surprise. Uh, historically, of course, we had an amazing complement of wild grazers. We've augmented that with several domestic grazing species. So disturbance is actually part of their evolutionary history. The trick is to get it right. Um, the media tends to focus on the overgrazing part. Uh, we say almost nothing about the other end of the spectrum, which would, would be overresting. In other words, cutting that ecological uh, process, that disturbance out of the system. But the trick, to, you know, obviously, is to graze somewhere between those those two extremes. And uh, I think. Uh, as a generalization, more and more people are agreeing with the fact that the media may have overhyped the overgrazing part. Uh, there isn't any denying that uh, we still have plenty of western rangelands that are overgrazed, but there's probably also um, quite a bit of land that is grazed that is being grazed somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. Now, and I don't know if this is going to show up well, but there are hundreds of uh, scientific studies, empirical studies, that have looked at the ecological effects of grazing. And personally, I feel this one by Tom Strolgram, who's a plant ecologist that actually here at CSU. His paper in ecological applications might be one of the very best studies uh, because he's a stickler for um, uh, study design. And so he uses these large plots. Um, and it's found some amazingly uh, surprising results when you actually spatially uh, capture the appropriate size of grazing. But anyhow, Tom and his colleagues published this paper in 1999 in Ecological Applications. And what they did was look at grazing exclosures on four service lands in four western states. And they compared um, the soil chemistry and the uh, plant communities within these areas in which grazing has been excluded with adjacent areas, still the same plant community, the same soil, uh, that uh, have been grazed. And some of the results um, that they did not find any difference in species richness for either grasses, forbs, or, or shrubs. So you had the same plant community. 
They didn't find any differences in uh, percent cover of grasses, forbs, and shrubs, and they didn't find any difference in percent soil nitrogen and carbon between the areas where grazing had been excluded and areas where grazing was ongoing. They concluded that grazing actually had little effect on the spread of exotic plant species, and that had been a charge uh, placed against domestic livestock grazing. And they concluded as well that actually very few plant, plant species showed consistent responses to grazing or the absence of grazing. So this is, this is an excellent paper. There are probably people in the room who know Tom Stolgram. He is not pro-domestic uh, animals. He is not pro-grazing. Uh, he's, he's probably actually very pro-healthy plant communities. Um, so uh, these are the type of studies that cause people to wonder about some of the sort of generalizations that the media tends to portray. L lots of other studies. This actually, I just pulled this out of a study that we did north of Fort Collins on livestock grazing. And we looked at the, the predator communities, um, the migratory songbird communities, and uh, the grass and forb communities on areas on working ranches, on protected areas where the livestock had been removed, and on the same, same plant community, the same soil type, on ranches that had been sold and houses put on every 35 acres. And what we found on these exurban rangelands were 23 species of non-native plants, and, and we're not obviously counting the cultivated plants around the houses themselves. Um, just 11 of these invasive plant species on the working ranches and 17 of these non-native invasive plant species on the protected areas that didn't have livestock. And if you know the watershed, the land uses, the players involved in it, basically what was happening on the protected areas is the managers had lost a management tool. And it, interestingly, after our study was published in Conservation Biology, the Division of Parks and Wildlife have reinstated livestock grazing on all that, uh, that 30,000 acres of state lands. And of course, the people on the small acreage properties, um, what, what you really find there, unfortunately, is overgrazing. And it's not intentionally, it's just sort of a lack of appreciation or, under, of, or understanding of what a couple of horses can do uh, 365 days a year on 35 acres. So. Anyhow, there's, there's lots of other things from the ecological perspective, but, but the evidence really does come out and support that ecologically ranching is probably a sustainable approach. Now, what about an economic uh, point to this? And this is actually a study that Andy Seidel did for all the counties in the state of Colorado. And what he did was come up with looking at county budgets, county and school district budgets, and then looking at the property taxes coming off these um, non-incorporated lands. In other words, uh, the rural parts of the county beyond the, the incorporated city limits. And he looked at um, land, uh, farm and ranch lands that now had houses on them, and he also looked at farm and ranch lands that were still in production. And what he found for the state, and he's, he's actually broken this down for each county, but what he found is for um, uh, rural lands that were in exurban development, small acreage properties, uh, the counties on average were having to come up with a dollar and 65 cents to cover the cost of county services and for the schools. In lands that stayed in agriculture, the county was actually creating a surplus because they were only having, on average, to come up with 35 cents uh, for county costs and to cover the cost of the schools for every dollar of property taxes. So if you take 1,000 acres and you put it in houses or you keep it in farming and ranching, you can see one creates a deficit and the other creates a surplus. And so from an economic point of view, it's really compelling, uh, you know, if you're fiscally conservative, to uh, try to keep land in food production. But it is increasingly expensive as well to um, farm and ranch, uh, which is not a surprise. And so 
Everybody in this business uh, is looking for additional streams of revenue that can augment that traditional uh, component of raising livestock. Now, this is the sort of interesting uh, dichotomy where the answer, at least I think the answer to building bridges in the American West comes from. Ranchers ensure, well, well ranchers produce food and they tie down open space. And now that ecosystem services is in our lexicon, those open spaces, when they're well tended, are producing ecosystem services. Okay, so these are the things ranchers do. Um, and the things consumers want, of course, is food. And they, they really uh, covet open space. It's the most amazing phenomenon, the, the most amazing unappreciated um, sort of trend today in the United States that our elected officials don't seem to fully appreciate. When, when Americans are given the choice to say, increase my taxes, like my sale taxes, so we can have an open space tax to buy open space, it's about two thirds of the time or more, they say yes to it. And they say, please increase our sale taxes or some type of tax so we have a coffer of money to go out and conserve open spaces against uh, the onrushing development. Um, so consumers have really made it clear that they covet open space. And I think we're starting to increasingly appreciate these ecosystem services that they provide us. Now ranchers, of course, the management focus on ranching is in livestock, right? So that's, where, that's what they're actually being compensated for. The things they're not being compensated for are the open spaces and the ecosystem services on those well-stewarded lands. So that's the sort of disconnect that we exist with today. So they're being compensated for their private good, which makes all the sense in the world, but they're not being compensated for the public goods that benefit all of us. And so increasingly, people are trying to develop these new markets, so private landowners on well-tended lands are actually being compensated for those ecosystem services and open space attributes. This Colorado Conservation Exchange, uh, it's just a local effort in northern Colorado. Uh, it's in its fourth year, and it's taken on this really um, uh, difficult challenge uh, to create a marketplace where ecosystem services can be sold by the private landowners and compensated by people participating in the marketplace. And there's, there's some of this work going on now at the Sylvandale Ranch, Roberts Ranch, and water sharing issues. But this is going on all across America. There are more and more people that are actually trying to engage not only in valuing the ecosystem services, as Andy Seidel talked about yesterday, but also trying to develop the marketplaces where you can be compensated for that value. Okay, so that was from the ecological point of view and from the economic point of view. Excuse me. This is a Wendell Berry quote, and I always, I always get very emotional when I see this. Sorry. Uh, pretty fine. So Wendell Berry, a lot of us are, are aware of him. He's, um, um, he's an essayist, he's a novelist, and he's a poet. And he's probably uh, the best thinker and writer on uh, people-land relationships today in the United States. And this was a quote that he gave a number of years ago in an interview, and I just thought it was absolutely perfect, speaking to the cultural aspects of ranchers and... Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I get way, way too emotional about that, this part of it. But, um, well, as you can see, so as important as any reason to support ranching, farming, irrigating, and logging, is that our society will need them as teachers, mentors, and critics in the years to come. And I like to sort of uh, get over the emotional part of this and, and enjoy it. Basically, what, what we're talking about, from a cultural point of view, these people have knowledge that we can't find on YouTube. Uh, this is slow wisdom. This is stuff that takes decades and decades to understand, and then it's transmitted 
within families. So this isn't, but whereas we live, of course, in a world of increasingly um, easy access to seemingly infinite amounts of information, and we go to YouTube for the answer to anything. But you won't learn how to log, you know, ranch farm irrigate and stuff like that by just typing that in YouTube. I'm, I'm sure you'll get a five minute spot on it, but I guarantee you it isn't gonna work very well if you've tried to follow it. So there is this real cultural value uh, in ranching. The other thing that's going on that, I, that I'm not entirely sure that we fully appreciate, but ranchers are actually providing leadership in this changing West. Um, and you can just see some of these things here. Uh, the Radical Center movement, and I had the great uh, fortune to work with um, a group of people in developing that. And Bill McDonald, who is, of course, a rancher in southeastern Arizona, he was part of this group of seven. Um, and, and it was his words that we named this movement. But then you can go down with all these other groups. You know, the Blackfoot Challenge, we just heard that. Um, and those guys actually talked about the Malpai. We have our own Laramie Foothills collaborative in its 21st year here. They, they, they just go on and on and on. And you think about where the West is right now, there's lots of people who are willing to engage in arguments uh, about the trajectories that are defining the future of our region. But these rancher-led, uh, collaboratives are the ones that they're sort of investing their time and their energy in a more constructive way because they're focusing on that 80 percent of things that they agree on as opposed to spending all their time and efforts uh, in that 20 percent of the things that that lots of people it's still sort of the the typical movement today in the West are investing their time on things that we can fight about where you're gonna have a winner but you're gonna have a loser and losers don't forget so um, yeah, I, I was really surprised one day. We, we did not take credit for this, of course, but when Time Magazine uh, had this cover, why the center is the new place to be, and we all called each other, but of course we made sure that we didn't think they were talking to us, they didn't interview us. <laughs> so, so that's something about, do you think, uh, from a cultural and economic and an ecological point of view, do you think that, that ranchers would qualify as a keystone species? So we've pretty much covered the major uh, categories, um, you know, the human dimension, the economic dimension, the environmental dimension, and is there compelling evidence to suggest that actually ranchers, by, even though they are very few in number, are having a disproportionate impact? The second thing is, what about this polarized America that we live in uh, that's increasingly disappointed, um, I hope, for most of us. And this is what, again, the media will tend to do. After a presidential election, they'll have story after story about the red-blue America. And David Brooks of the New York Times will, will posit his theory that Americans are simply resorting themselves so they can live close to like-minded people. The more interesting thing about this, to me, actually, is looking at the metropolitan counties versus the non-metropolitan, so think rural counties. And what it shows you is the metropolitan counties tend to, with, with a few exceptions, they tend to vote blue, democratic, kind of liberal. And the non-metropolitan counties, the rural counties, tend to vote Republican, conservative, uh, that. Uh, so. Um, what it really shows to me is we, there, there does appear to be a red-blue America, and it, it appears to be this divide between rural and urban counties. So uh, that's the thing that I think about when you look at the ecology, the economics, and uh, the culture of ranching, because there's nothing America needs more right now than bridges being built instead of this increasing separation and polarization. I mean, there's, we obviously have lots of domestic challenges. The only way we're going to address those is by coming together, finding that common ground the way uh, the Blackfoot Challenge does it at a watershed level. So getting back to this slide, what ranchers produce, food, which of course is essential, and open spaces that have these vital ecosystem services. These are public goods, 
water and biodiversity and carbon being sequestered in the soil and stuff like that. And of course, what consumers want. So if you, if you have a nice match here, then what a better, I mean, is there a better way to begin conversations and working together to build this? So let's just look at a couple of these. Can, can ranchers curb urban sprawl? You know, we've been reassured simply by the ballot box that, uh, that urban people really covet open space. And so what role can ranchers do on that? Well, there's this thing called partnerships for rangeland trusts and these are the state cattle organizations in western states um, that have either created within the state cattlemen's association or have a partnership with an existing statewide land trust 